not good. It's a game of millimeters. Trying mm -hmm. to get right, it really is. Trying to get right in the middle of the screen. Hello, everybody. As you see me trying to position myself in the middle of the screen, like we're professionals or something here. Um, hello, and welcome to We Are Listening for another week. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, this is our bi-weekly salon, talking about the experiences and viewpoints uh, primarily of us from the melanated hue in the theater world. And everybody, please welcome my co-host, Jacole Kitchen. What's up, Jacole? Hey, everybody. Hey, Ahmed. Good to see you, as always. Good to see you. We are getting ready to rock and roll. We're going to have a fun time tonight. We have a couple of spectacular guests. I know this is going to be uh, a great conversation. A couple of things as everybody's coming into the room, just want to remind you, please make sure you have your camera and your microphone, your camera off and your microphone muted. Uh, it might help to go into your settings and uh, make sure that you have chosen to only see pr video participants. Um, so again, make sure your microphone and your video are turned off. You should only be seeing me, Jacole, and our guest this evening. Uh, I do want to give you a couple of quick announcements as we uh, as we get ready to get started here. A couple of things happening here at the at the rep. Our spectacular production of JQA has been extended through November 29th. It is available for streaming right now. Uh, you can check it out on our website or get tickets to watch it at our website at sdrep.org. It's written by Aaron Posner, directed by Sam Woodhouse. It, uh, the film director, Tim Powell, and it stars Crystal Lucas Perry, Larry Bates, Jesse Perez, and Rosina Reynolds. It is an excellent show, especially in our current political climate. It will make you laugh and think. So uh, don't shy away from it. Make sure you check it out. It will make you think about things that are going on in a different way. Also want to talk to you about Unveiled. Unveiled is a one woman show starring Rohina Malik. And she is sharing personal stories of five Muslim women in a post 9-11 world. That will be streaming November 13th through the 15th. So please head on over to sdrep.org and get your tickets for that. And as far as we are listening, as we continue to bring very interesting people to come on and talk to you, Coming up on December 18th, we're going to go back to back days with We Are Listening in a couple of weeks. On December 18th will be a very special episode. Our guest will be San Diego Rep Artistic Director Sam Woodhouse, and he will be talking to us about the Rep's plans to address equity, diversity, and inclusion as we are uh, now and as we move into the future. So those of you who've been wanting to hear from Sam on these issues, he will be joining us on December 18th at 5.30, and then on December 19th, the next day at 5.30 p.m., November, I'm sorry, I said December. That's why Sharissa is the superstar that she is, to catch me when I say stuff that doesn't make any sense. That is two weeks, November 18th, Sam Woodhouse will be joining us here on We Are Listening, and then on November 19th, the day after, we will be welcoming a uh, new rep board member, Jasmine Sadler. She is a real life rocket scientist and now a member of the San Diego rep board. We'll also be talking to John Brooks, board member at Moxie Theater and also a filmmaker. And we'll also be talking with Dr. Stephanie R. Bolger. She is the vice chancellor of institutional services at San Diego Community College and a board member at the Old Globe. So that's just, that is what will be going on with We Are Listening, head on over to sdrep.org slash listening to get links to sign up for those spectacular conversations that you don't want to miss. Jacole, what's happening around your way? Uh, as always, we continue to have the Digital Wow series. Um, right now, you can see on our web, or you can connect through our website to full episodes of Listen With The Lights Off, the spooky radio series through, uh, that produced through So Say We All. Uh, all four episodes of Walks of Life, a really fantastic uh, audio listening program put together by Blind Spot Collective. The final episode, Walks of Life, episode four, uh, is all by Black artists. All of the writers, composers, uh, voices you hear, everybody, the people who made the music, it's all uh, BIPOC artists. And we have the complete series of Society of Wonder, a really, really fun um, mystery puppet series put together by Animal Cracker Conspiracy. Everything is 
available to find more information on our website, lahoyaplayhouse.org. Thank you very much, Jacole. Again, all of you who are just coming into the room, make sure you have your videos off, make sure you have your microphone muted. And right now, let's go ahead and get into We Are Listening. Please welcome our wonderful, very fun guests for this evening. This is going to be a great conversation. Please welcome Kaya Dunn and Stephen Busher. Come on in, y'all. Welcome. Uh, hey. hey, girl. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, some there we Don't go. Don't be shy, look, Steven. Look, oh, with the and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Who is yeah. it? Yeah. Bear's toenail. It's gonna be a very boring, serious conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it was gonna be fun, so hey. <laughs> Hey, Kaya, Steven, good time. I love it. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We greatly appreciate it for you guys taking the time to sit down with us and talk to the folks about what's going on and, you know, how we're seeing things in the world right now. And before we get into it, you know, we did some real brief introductions, but we always like to take a moment to let y'all introduce yourselves to the folks, you know, tell them a little bit about yourself and how you got into this performing arts world and how we got here. And uh, we'll start with you, Kaya. Oh, of course. I was going to let Stephen go first. <laughs> like, you know I was going to start with you. <laughs> um, sure. So I'm currently um, an assistant professor of theater and the head of the acting program at University of North Carolina in Charlotte. But before that, I was based in San Diego for 14 years. Um, on and off, we came and left and came and left um, and worked at Cal State San Marcos, but also um, did most of my career as an actor and a director and then activist uh, in San Diego. So that is why I'm East Coast now here and um, had a collective of people uh, that I met with, particularly Black women, um, and also was a, an associate artist at both Moxie Theater and Lambs Players Theater in San Diego. Cool, cool. Steven, what's up? Let's see. Well, well, well. Um, I feel like I need to start with uh, getting kicked out of my house at 16. Well, I got kicked out <laughs> living with my mom in New Mexico. She said, I can't deal with you anymore. Go move with your father. So move to Indianapolis. And that's when I went to a performing arts high school. And I think that's, that's actually where I felt like I could put who I really am into the theater, into the you know, I'm, I now have two teenagers, so it feels like appropriate to begin with like the teenage years of where do you put this stuff. So I recently heard somebody say that theater saved their life. I don't know if it saved my life, but I think it made my life. I feel like it really gave me that outlet in the crowd. So I've been hooked by the audience ever since. And my path has been, um, I went to CalArts for undergrad. Um, and that's interesting. That's where I, that's where I kind of discovered other black misfits. It's like the misfit dancers and the filmmakers <laughs> and the West Indian poets and the you know Muslim painters and the, it, it was J Beverly Hills black. I mean, there were so many. It felt like where I was, there weren't a lot of different folks. But when I ended up in, there was a small pocket of us but we were all strange and all weird and we all kind of like coalesced in this pack and we were nothing alike um okay i won't get into that but um <laughs> then i went to i ended up getting seduced into physical theater so i joined uh the del arte international school of physical theater and i was a company member there for 10 years helped run the school um, this is where you're making your own work so devising work. And then I kind of got sort of stumbled upon this like mainstream Lort kind of world and teaching in places. And so I've, I, I feel like my whole life I've been the, the outsider on the inside in different ways. And I still feel that way, um, even though with EDI having our five minutes of fame, um <laughs> and the clock is ticking <laughs> it's ticking we're at four minutes yeah. and 30 seconds oh <laughs> you better get it now it's ticking <laughs> but it feels like uh that there are more voices i feel more connected now to the 
to my colleagues and people and my fellow weirdos um, now more than ever before. It just feels like borders have fallen away. So I'm currently the head of movement at UCSD and I recently came from ACT in the Bay. Stephen, I, I love that phrase, uh, theater didn't save my life, but it made my life. I've mm -hmm. always tried to figure out how to how to verbalize that because yeah no I mean I wasn't it wasn't a do or die situation yeah, for yeah. me but it was certainly I needed something I needed it you know I needed my to find people I needed to find an outlet and it was that so I'm, I'm gonna have to steal that from you I will I will credit you when <laughs> when it feels right to but, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm gonna take that for sure <laughs> um so you know uh it's funny that you said the the you know, the, the, the five minutes, I'm gonna come back to that. Um, so, you know, we, we know why we're here. We know how this show came about. We know how so many, we know how this five minutes came about. Like we, we, we know where we're at. And um, so I, I just wanna get, you know, from each of you and I'll, I'll continue with you, Stephen, just kind of your impression on how, you know, with the combination of COVID and of course, you know, all the deaths that we saw leading up to, you know, the kind of the the main match of George Floyd and now how we're in this moment where all these organizations and theaters have made these statements and everyone seems to care about race issues at the moment. Um, give me a little bit of your personal reflection on what that what this has been like for you this, you know, this spring in the summer now fall in the winter of 2020. Mm hmm. I mean, it's bringing back so much stuff. Like when I was at CalArts, all the black students, we all boycotted the season because there were no black plays whatsoever. That's 1992 or 1991. Uh, we were boycotting as part of the Rodney King verdict because CalArts was in Valencia where most of the cops lived, um, went down to South Central, everything on fire. Um, in that moment, you know, I, I was I was the lead in a play the night the verdict was announced and the night L.A. kind of erupted. And, you know, I think it was somebody's thesis project. I was the lead in it. It was, I think, a two character play or a three character play. And I was like, OK, am I am I an actor or an artist in this moment or am I black in this moment? Mm. And it was like, what's what's more important doing this play? where I know this person has put so much energy and so much of their work into this, or do I need to go down to first AME church and hear what people are saying? So I was talking to people really quickly. The show was about to open and people were like, Steven, you, you got to go down to South Central. You've got to go to South. You got to go to South Central. It's not even a question. Theater, theater, theater is theater. It can wait. Somebody will replace that. It'll still happen. But what you're going to face in the world and what you have faced requires you to be in South Central tonight. So I ended up doing that. And it's, it's stuck with me about what is theater? What's being in a play mean? What so the, the George Floyd and everybody who's been ruthlessly murdered. It's like, here we are again. I, I, I still haven't watched that eight minutes and 46 seconds. Or well, uh -uh. I, I, I can't watch that. Um, I watched like 20 seconds of it and I went, <sighs> I mean, this is any of us on any night. This is, you know, this is our students trying to get to class or come home from a rehearsal. This is everybody. So it was like, it's it wrapped me up. And I think, um, you know, it's been great having like a coterie of black folks to like bounce stuff off of. Um, other than that, you know, I've been in a lot of black spaces, a lot of BIPOC spaces, but other than that, I'm not trying to share this, my feelings with everybody, to everybody. I'm, I'm not trying to take care of anybody except, you know, the, the 1619 posse. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what i feel like is first and foremost and in every meeting i'm in every every move i'm trying to make now is how are we building structures and designs to um like 
buttress and support the 1619 because I know this this is about to disappear so we got to have stuff in place so that's kind of where the summer hit me how about you Kaya I mean I'll pick up right where Stephen left off where he said it's about to disappear what I'm facing right now is watching the disappearance of progress that was made because of the way that this executive order was written. So it was touted as something about training for federal first federal employees and federal contractors. But it actually states that you can't get grants and you can't do, um, you know, you, there's teaching things that you can't do. And it affects anybody who gets any sort of federal money. And so, you know, we had a proposal about a black arts project and now we're looking at not being able to apply for an NEA grant because in order to say why you need to have spaces for black people, you have to talk about what has been missing. Um, and so I don't even think we're in the five minutes. I think there was such a strong reaction and we saw it, you know, with the election, there was such a strong reaction to people asserting that there has been a problem um, that, the backlash and we i knew like i knew the minute people said this is a moment of change i was like five four three <laughs> two because we did i mean jacole i think you were there but when i was at cal state we did twilight los angeles in 2014 2015 and we were actually going to start that show with a list of the people who'd been murdered by police um while we were in rehearsal and it was tamir rice it was all of that and the list got so long that we couldn't do it. So we had started a slideshow and that slideshow became so enormous that we could not do that. And I just, when we talk about like this moment, that's another thing that I get really upset about because I, um, you know, you talked about Cal Arts. Roberta <clears throat> Uno had a consortium in New York in 1984 called Training Theater Students of Color. I went to my conservatory in North Carolina in 1998. I went to my undergrad in 2002. I first came to San Diego in 06 as a young actor. We weren't talking about this, right? Toni Morrison in 74 said, racism serves as a distraction from your work. She said, somebody says you don't have a culture, so you spend your life trying to prove it, right? And it's like, we're all artists. We're all really good artists. And our work is based in black art and being black informs it, but it feels to me like the EDI work that is being done is still centered around helping white people stay in power and keep their jobs and do their jobs better. It's not mm. actually based around how do we, I mean, I attended the first We Are Listening conversation and it was really interesting because I know a lot of those people to hear the reflections and to hear people say, oh, I want a seat at the table. And I thought like, screw that. Like we need our own. That has been the request when I was there 15 years ago. Right? Like, it's not like people are just hearing these things for the first time. And so I'm very skeptical. There needs to be change, but I no longer do come to the table, let's all talk, have civil conversations without a where, what is the end outcome? Because my time is finite. I have children, I have art, I have a limited lifespan. And I've seen this bleed people dry. I've seen the legacy of people who've existed. I did not hear about Dr. Gaffney nearly as much when I was in San Diego as when I left. And then I went into Black spaces like Black Theater Network and his name was called out and I thought, oh, I, I know him. Like I, and I realized how many people, I mean, I knew his impact because I'm, I'm close to the Gaffney family and I've seen the reflections and, and what, you know, his theater has done. But to see the national impact he's had and not hear about him when I was a young artist in San Diego was really atrocious to me. And I think mm. there's been a lot of that erasure. And what that erasure does is it allows people to go, oh, we're, we're reinventing, this is a new moment, this is a new time. Well, how many new times do you wear out people? And do you mm. drive people from the city because they're not able to sustain themselves and they're exhausted from trying to exist and explain racism in a place that insists that it's California and it's not racist. Yeah, I, I, that exhaustion, like for me is, um, <clears throat> is funny because as we're having discussions about anti-racism training and, you know, I'm, I'm usually, I'm, I'm usually the somewhat Neanderthal in any room I'm in when it comes to stuff <laughs> like this. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
the question was asked to me, you know, like, well, what do you think about this? What do you, and I, I, and I just, I'm just being real. I was like, I, I don't have a reference. I, I don't have a reference in my life for anti-racism training. Like I, I don't have a place to where I, I, it's still foreign to me, even in all this talk that's going on right now, it's foreign to me. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't know the mechanics of it. I know it's a huge industry where people are making a lot of money right now. I know that much because I look at how people make money, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't have the, I don't know. I just don't have the the wherewithal or the reference for it because it's something to me that sounds, it sounds crazy. I understand what it is, but for me, it sounds crazy that we have to go through all this and go through mm -hmm. these hoops well, of having this official, like I understand it, but just as me as a black man, it drives me nuts because I don't understand. You know, I, I understand it, but I don't. So here's a couple of things though, like to <laughs> assume that every person of color, black person, Asian person would be equipped to do anti-racism training because it's a field and a study. And we would never say, Jacole, you do theater, get behind the light board and design this. Like we understand <laughs> that. It's the same issue I have with the way BIPOC has been conflated or people of color was conflated when I was in San Diego, right? So everything is through this very white lens. And so Ahmad, as a black man, you must be able to explain all of this to us when it's <laughs> it's it's theory like it's it's study it's history it's but then also we don't all need to approach it from the same you don't need the same anti-bias like we don't need to all sit together in a room because there's a very different structure for you mm. about maybe self-decolonization or healing or than there is for your colleagues who are just starting to think about this because you have like the valid lived experience and other experiences. And so that's the other thing of like, oh, we're all going to sit here and pretend like we're at the same starting point. That's super problematic, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Stephen, you said earlier um, that you had to ask yourself, and this sounds like it was much earlier in your career, but you had to ask yourself in this moment, am I black or am I an artist? Um, do you feel like you still have to make that distinction because you know I would say at this point all of us have a seat at the table you know whatever whether how, however that seat is treated that's a different story um how we are treated in that seat I was watching this movie on um Netflix with my stepmom the other day misbehavior about the women's limb movement and and there was a moment that Kira Knightley's character said she was an acknowledgement my seat at the table is a high chair and <laughs> that is that is the, you know that is how we feel sometimes. Um, but an acknowledgement at it, we are all at the table at this point, mm -hmm, whatever mm -hmm. our perspective table is. Do you feel like you still have to make that distinction? And Kai, I'd love your uh, thoughts on this as well. Do you still have to make that distinction? Am I a black? Am I black or am I artist? Am I black or am I an educator? Uh, you know, do you feel like you still have to make that divide? I mean, I feel like the divide, I mean, something that I'm starting to think about is what do people lead with? And sometimes, you know, that's why the, this diversity and, you know, making something culturally inclusive, and this is what's happening in politics, it's not enough to just have a black face in the room. Mm -hmm. Is somebody coming in with some kind of agenda that is looking after black needs? or Asian needs or whatever the scenario is, is somebody coming with that? Because it's not enough just that you're here. So I feel like um, getting in the lawsuit at ACT was me taking a very firm stand with other black folks saying, we are black and we are bartenders and we are ushers and we are part of the artistic team and we are guest artists and we are playwrights and we are not we're trying not to continue on the path that we're being put on so i feel like once i formally publicly said you know what i'm taking a stand for black folks i haven't really turned back because it's always i mean you all may have felt this way um countless meetings 
where people, white colleagues afterwards say, Stephen, are you okay? Are you okay? Wow, what she <laughs> said in that room, are you okay? Uh, I can't believe he said that. And, you know, I'm so, we're so used to it, right? We're used to it. I put that somewhere. It's somewhere here. But I can't dwell on that foolishness. I got to keep moving. I can't let that hobble me. That's not my Achilles heel. But it is giving me strength when it's time. So I feel like things have just sort of compressed for me and I'm leading and I'm getting more vocal about blackness. And I really don't think that the future of uh, theater training in this country is about um, putting people in different positions that already exist. It's about people with vision being able to lay out new groundwork for a whole new thing to happen. And, and I, I actually question the vision of many people in leadership right now who actually do not have the vision. You talk about anti-racism training. It's like you don't get a certificate in having a vision. You have to have, have lived experience, have known people, have watched, have listened. And that's how you can start to make deductions on how things could go, not a little bit differently, but like fundamentally differently, like irrigation or the pyramids. <laughs> no, we could irrigate this so that we don't have to dig this up every year. Thank you, Persians or whoever that came from. But right. that's the kind of thinking that the theater needs. And it's not it's not people who are replacing. It's not how uh, Habib Diata is going to replace Carolyn O'Reilly. That's not what we're talking about. And if that's what you're talking about, you're you're already obsolete. This is about new foundational thinking that has to happen in these places. Yeah, I would argue foundational thinking that's been happening in spaces that aren't white, right? Like so. Black theaters, theaters run by mothers, those theaters got right up after COVID because they always exist in spaces that aren't built for them. They've always existed. Yeah. We have always operated on the margins. So for me, I mean, I got in trouble for the first time and kicked out of something in college, in undergrad, right? So I'm pretty sure that was the demarcation mark of you're a Black artist because your Black mouth opened up a little too <laughs> loudly and got you in trouble. And it continued from there. And it, it shaped the way that I, I mean, I, I did 10 years professionally before I became, you know, started. And I started at Playwrights. Like, that's where I realized, oh, actually, once I started going into, um, at Playwrights Project, once I started going into juvenile justice um, centers and seeing kids that had gotten accepted to Juilliard but were sent to Juvenile Hall instead, um, and going to the former foster youth uh, and, and working with them, I thought, oh, I'm good at, I'm good at this. And I actually got placed with a lot of people that other artists were having trouble working with but it was because I'd walked some of those things and I realized, oh, there, people are looking at them like they have a deficit, but actually like these are the stories we're not being told, mm -hmm. right? Like this is the artist that we need in the room. And so I think being black, being on the outside, being questioned about who I was, never being the person that was centered or thought of for something helped me to see what are the ways around doing this? I think that has matured as I've continued to work, but I don't think that was ever a separation I was able to make because the space was never meant for me. I'm not even in the black space that was created, this little corner in white theater that was created for the black space. I don't tap dance. I wasn't a certain, I don't sing gospel music. I didn't look a certain way. And so therefore that those two roles that came out every year were also not for me, right? We're in a a time where we're seeing more and the work was always there too. That's the thing is like, I so appreciate, I, I a couple of years ago, I called um, Indira Atwaru who works at Billie Holiday. And I was talking to her about like these things I wanted to do with black women. And she's like, hi, we're doing that already. Um, weird. And, and so then for me, it was about like, who are the other people I need to be in community with? Who's going to sharpen me? Because I can't keep having this conversation explaining things to white people. That is, again, Toni Morrison, that's a waste of my time. Mm. What I can do is catch fire 
with people who see the vision, who are doing this. And in this moment, some of that is starting to coalesce with the larger society. And, you know, my friend was like, welcome to the party. Like there have been, and that is something I'm very clear about. The work that I do stands on the shoulders of a lot of other people, right? And and I think that's one of the problems in training programs right now is they tell black kids that they're exceptional. And I always tell my students, you're special. You're not exceptional. Exceptional would mean you're an exception to the rule. And there are so many, those weirdos. I mean, I remember going to New York a couple of years ago and talking to my black friends and being like, we just didn't have the internet. Like we didn't realize, <laughs> like now you can go to the internet and you see all the kids who like, you know, ska or this or that we didn't have that and so people were able to tell us you're an outsider you're exceptional you're different and that doesn't exist anymore and that is where i think this thing is going to explode and i'm really excited like i am excited working with young people because they have no patience for they have no patience for the bs yeah. they just i mean and and not just black kid like white kids too are like why aren't we being taught this why are we still doing plays from the 1960s why aren't they talking to us about these other histories and so you're seeing a real generational divide right now where people are saying well we need to slow down people want to change they don't know what they want and students are very aware of what is missing from their education and young theater artists are very aware of what is missing from the theater. And I think for a long time, theater leaders were able to say young people aren't interested in the art form. They're not interested in the, the verbalness of it. They don't, their, their computers have made them unsophisticated. And I don't think that was ever the case. I think we haven't been programming things. Why do I wanna go and see your version of what my suffering is like? Why would, why would I pay $85? <laughs> to go watch what you think my life is like and I don't recognize it. Mm. Mm. You know, it's interesting, Kaya, you said, um, even as you were here in San Diego and, and not fitting into the mold because you don't sing, you don't tap dance, you don't. I think that one of the things that we're finding now, and maybe it's the computer age as you're talking, maybe, but maybe it's the necessity to create our own shit is we are in this place where people are multi-hyphenate artists. You're not just any one thing. And and I think the two of you are also great examples of that, of, of creating, and, and it's exactly, I think that along the line, Stephen, of what you were saying as well, that it's not just about replacing the titles that exist and putting black folks and, and BIPOC artists in there but creating your own spaces and creating your own paths. And I think it's it's interesting now that we are seeing so many BIPOC artists that are just like, no, okay, you, I don't fit in your box. Here's what I do. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna create my own thing. And I, well, and and I, I do I, wonder, yeah, if that's out of necessity or out of convenience because of the internet age. I th No, I, I think that's always been the case with black. And I'm gonna talk really specifically about black art, right? And yeah. knowing that this, this goes into other identities, right? But I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to work together at my school is because there isn't this silo of just theater, right? Like the black arts movement exists in art. In, you know, if you go to a national black theater in Harlem, there's tons of art everywhere and there's science and there's literature because we have always been expressive in multi-hyphenated ways. I don't think that's new. What I do think is being is and and we've always been teachers there's i've been um my family's from cape verde and i've been diving into emil car cabral and he's been talking about um he talks about you know your your it's always your responsibility to be a professor or to teach and that's something i struggled with because theater education was sort of this thing over here and i was like no i love i love directing and i love working with other artists like it's not that i only want to be in this little box but this is a deep part of, and I realized like, not only is it my calling, it's my heritage. I come from generations of people who said, no matter what you do, your job is to teach and make sure that this passes to the next person. And so to define mm -hmm. somebody is only, and I, I had this talk with somebody at one of the unions who was saying like, oh, we only want intimacy directors to be intimacy directors. And I said, tell me one black woman that you know that does one thing. 
<laughs> and I just, I just directed a Tanya Pinkins play and I loved it because she said, you know, my play has lots of conflict because that structure, right, of here's the conflict, it gets solved, we have the denouement, like it's all, she said, what black person has one problem that they spend mm -hmm. their lives solving? And it's like, yes, like I know not one black woman that I can name that does one thing. We're not raised that way. It's not part of our culture. And I don't think our art works that way. I think, I mean, I do sing, I don't sing gospel musical theater, right? Um, but like, I exist in a multi-hyphenated way and I exist in community and creating community is just as important for me in my theater making as it is in my personal life. Like I cannot come to the theater without bringing my motherness my deep care for my community, for my sons, for my daughters in a, you know, in a global sense, the spiritual part of myself, mm -hmm. like all of those things. If I take those away so that you're comfortable with me, I'm doing you a disservice. You're not going to get my best work. But if we create spaces where people can show up, even if you don't understand them, right? So you don't understand how this works because I'm not simple. I'm not making myself simple enough for you but I will bring something to my directing, to my acting, because I'm able to exist as my full self. And the job I think right now of white theater makers is to sit back and let that happen and not have to fit it into a box. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, something I've been thinking about is like, when you, when you invite somebody black in, what exactly are you inviting in? And I, I've seen black students get told to be quiet during somebody's performing because it's their time when they're just like, hey, yes, 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 yes. Everybody's boosting people, amplifying, giving props. And shh, can you be quiet? I mean, this is in, in training situations. So can, are we allowed to bring spirit into the room? Are we a, allowed to bring process into the room? So. I, I would say, you know, I've been to West Africa and we know we talk about CPT. Time, time maybe is more connected to uh, the authentic moment and not connected to the clock. And I feel like a lot of these places want to connect productivity and creativity on the clock. And that's not really what we do. So I was recently in a situation where me and the black woman who was directing this piece, you know, we're, 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 it's a high stakes profile. It's a high stakes scenario, new play, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're at the, the, our composer was at the piano player. We're hanging out, we're playing Whitney Houston. We start gathering around the piano. People are singing, we're banging on things. And then the stage manager's like, uh, can we stop and get back to work? And it's like, okay, she's running this room. She's the director. I'm running this rehearsal because it's about to be choreography. What do you mean get back to work? This is getting us to the work. We are working here by by singing, by forging community, by being together, by passing food around. We are, this is the work. There's no other work. And I'll tell you what, if we came in, sat behind tables, turned lights on from five to five, five to six, we wouldn't have got where we got because we did Whitney Houston. And I, the thing I keep thinking about is, are the, is there room in these predominantly white spaces for different ways of being, different complete processes of creating or understanding that to lay back is not lazy. To lay back is to reflect, is to wait. We need to wait. It's not all, it doesn't all work like that. I mean, I've seen, sometimes it's hard to make a pitch for people to go see theater. I mean. I've devoted my life to it, and I, I often say, what play should I see? There's a lot of bad plays to see right now, so don't go see a play. Go to a concert. And I think it really, it continues to be this cycle of how you are supposed to behave 
in rehearsal, in production, in performance, in creation, in meet and greets, in the theater itself. And it's like, until you understand that when you are bringing us in, you the potential is to bring all of us in, our total selves in. And if you do that, then something is going to shift that you can no longer control. <laughs> Which is going to lead to the next uh, iteration of what this theater is going to be, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's something that Kaya said that sparked this thought in me. I was talking with Richard Trujillo yesterday from uh, SD, I can never, I can't SDS remember. SDSCPA. I forget all San Diego things. School of Curfew. <clears throat> San Diego. Frick, now you got me doing it. S -E -S -E <laughs> San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts. What she said. <laughs> uh, I was talking to him yesterday, you know, we were talking about, you know, the pipeline, you know, what, like how, you know, how do we see what we see? And I was explaining to him that my route in here is that, you know, coming from the administrative and, you know, ticketing side of things when i first started doing this i didn't see anybody else who looked like me in this space there was i i didn't know there there was nobody who i could look to or like oh they do what i do like i met nikki cooper and we met at a conference but we didn't see anybody else that we knew that looked like us that did what we did you know and uh it, it was just something you said kai because that's that's from that day that's always been my responsibility in the lane that i am in this I'm not a singer. I'm not a dancer. I'm not, I don't do this. I do this thing on this end, on this backside that nobody sees. But for me, it was important for me to try to do it. And like you said, try to become something that wasn't not just mm -hmm. fit into some, like I've, I've tried to become, I've tried to become something in this space that no one could pin me down in because I wanted little people who look like me to see me in this space to know that oh i can go into that space in the theater and i can deal with software and i can deal with ticketing and i can learn fund development and i can learn all this business side that will take me to learn how to start my own theater or go work over here or into this other other place you know what i mean so it's, i think that's what i picked up on it's like it's that parallel thing of like i'm not we're not here to fit into your mold. There's so much more of us that we do, that we can do, that we know, then you're willing to open your eyes and see. Erin Ann Daniels just came in. I try to bring people into my class so that students can, and one of the big things for me is getting more students into arts administration, getting more mm -hmm. black, brown, Asian students into arts administration and and letting people see artistic directors. So Delicia's come in, we had Victor Vasquez, um, who's a casting director who runs, I think he's got the only casting office that's all people of color. Um, and, and to let my students hear and see what these spaces look like, including again, my white students, so that they understand that this is what can be and it's, it's not foreign or new or novel to them, right? But Karen Ann and I were talking and she said, I'm trying to be the person I didn't have, right? Mm. And for our student, I think so many of us, like some of us were really lucky. I have colleagues that went to HBCUs or grew up in, you know, Delicia will talk about this. She grew up in a black community. And I think there is an advantage in that because you don't go through the same sort of like, where do I fit in? What am I doing? But to make sure that, that young people are connected and seeing the people we know, we know what's missing when we didn't have it, or we know even if we did have it, who wasn't listened to, right? Or who our elders, who wore our elders out. So how do we avoid that? How do we make sure that people are seeing a med, like you said, that this is this is also a possibility. This is a route for you because the talent is there. I went to a pipeline to profession thing at TCG and there was a lot of hemming and hawing and meanwhile, like students were telling them, this is what we need. Female artistic directors were saying, this is what we need. And some of those leaders were saying, well, no, we just shouldn't train people um, who aren't wealthy because it's not practical after all these people shared. And that, I mean, that really was a, a turning point for me where I was like, I can't be in these spaces right now. Like I really need to focus my energy because this will drive me nuts. Right. So how are we the people? And I mean, we had, you know, I referenced, we had the colored girls group when I was there. And it was, I was talking to Jacole about this before, like 
all of us were the one black girl in our artistic organizations. And Ahmed, you said earlier, somebody asked you about something. And I think we also don't think about the danger of that. When you have one or two black people, they're usually not the top person. And then they're asked for their opinion on very specific things. But I have given my opinion and then not been able to work for a year. And that's not an ideological shift. That's something that affected my ability to feed my family. That is an economic reality for me that if I speak up and say what is actually happening or speak truth, I'm not going to be invited back into that room. So either I am the black body that protects you and you say, oh, well, I talked to Kaya and she was okay with it, right? Or <laughs> I speak up and I have to leave the city because I told you the truth about, or my truth at least, not in a mean way, not in a rude way. And now I am not going to be part of the circle because I'm not compliant. And I know this because again, I've spoken to other people in that circle that we've had who experienced the same exact thing. Where it was like, mm -hmm. do you speak up? Do you speak out? And then you have to go. It's funny, yep. these conversations make me think so much about my own journey and the um, that no, I was always the only one in the room kind of coming up through my journey, but I kind of, I've always wondered why didn't I realize that? Why didn't I notice it? Um, but one of the things that I always say is growing up, I learned so much of my blackness from my white mother. She was the one who had us in Nevadans Against Apartheid. She was the one that had us in the African dance classes. She mm. was the one that was very vocal in having Highland Avenue change to Martin Luther King Boulevard. But, and so I realized that I actually was shown and, and taught the barriers that exist for black folks and people of color, but I was given the confidence of a white person that just believes that no space doesn't exist for me. And so I've just been able to go about that world and go, oh yeah, no, of course I belong here. No, nobody else looks like me, but I fucking belong here. Like, what do you, what do you think? There, I'm mad you got two out of me so far. Um, but one of the things that I would love, because I know that we're, we're getting a little bit short on time, but I would love to just hear um, kind of the differences and the challenges that exist in academia, because I, I have like 19 questions that I didn't even get to because this is just such a this is talking amongst friends, which is exactly yeah, what yeah. we knew it would be. Um, but I do want to hear about the differences that you the differences of challenges that you feel that you face in that academia, that education, uh, like you said, educational theater, Kaya versus the the professional theater. And it's even strange to be making that distinction. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, I part of the reason I went here is because I knew it would give me the platform. I'm not saying anything different than I said 15 years ago in San Diego, right? But I was just an actor. And so hmm. once I figured out academia gave me the platform to say, hey, we're training people in a way that's damaging and we're actually hurting humans, not in the theater, like people are leaving these programs and they are not functional. Hey, when you do this, you cut off people's lifeline and ability to make money as an artist. And so you're only allowing really nice white artists to make money. Academia gave me that, the, the like BS, and the crap that happens, it exists in both spaces. The like fake woke liberalness exists in both spaces. Um, and so I feel like theater was actually a really great training ground to go into academia because it all looked familiar. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, here we go. Um, there's more money. And I mean, honestly, like I always wonder why people disdain like educational productions because I saw the budgets for some of these shows and I was like, shit, I have how much money for costumes? <laughs> about this? Yeah, 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 no, that's not a lot of money, right? Like, and we have six months to rehearse and I get a dramaturg, like, I don't, I don't, I mean, I and I went to School of the Arts, like I went to a conservatory and I remember having worked in that theater and then going to Broadway and being like, these theaters suck. Because <laughs> we had so much money. Um, and so that's the thing that I see. I think there was more of the like, oh, she doesn't do real theater for a little bit. But now it's just like, the and the work I do, because 
the work I do is focused on making sure that it is a safe passage for students and that the world they are going into is safe. One of the things I say is I'm creating my colleagues. I'm creating the people I wanna work with. I'm creating the people who are going to make the theater I wanna do. Um, and our work, our research is that. So for me, it's actually been, it's exhausting. Like, so the, the, the challenge is time, right? Because now there's all these things I want to do and I'm trying to do and exist in space. And it can move you to places that where there's not as much, like, so there's not as much theater in Charlotte as I let, like I miss my community. But, um, but it gave me a space from which to develop and hone what I need, what I knew I needed to say, and what I had been trying to say, and it gave me a platform to say it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Kaya, you mentioned something earlier about students and loving working with young folks. My feeling is, and this has always been the case, that having a uh, I've I keep working at places where there's a professional company attached to the school, so Trinity Rep. I was at Brown, ACT, um, and now UCSD, La Jolla a little bit, that relationship. We're trying, we're trying. We're trying, we're, we're trying. trying. It's, 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 <laughs> the future looks bright. <laughs> I'll start one with you, Stephen. Let's get that one. <laughs> so, but anyway, the students have always held the professional theater company to task, taken them to task always, because they're not employees. Mm -hmm. They're not employees. They have a different investment in this and they can say different things and they can do different things and they can put different things in their work. Um, and that's something during this pandemic, it's like, wow, so many theaters shut down, but the universities did not shut down. So theater is still happening in the universities, is this? So it almost seems like there should be theater companies inside universities as almost like shelters, mm -hmm. um, if that's yeah. where work is gonna continue to happen once the shutdown happens. But um, so working in academia, it's, it's always just like new ideas. I think the problem comes in when the gatekeepers, um, are, are still trying to run things the way things have been run. I'm sorry, we're beyond body image now. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we, you, you need to know that this person is from the West Indies and this person is Nigerian, this person is black from Philly. You gotta know that now. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're not trying to re, we're not trying to retrain. So, and the students are not one to mess with it. The students are wanting to sprint, run and do the thing. So it's always whether or not the Institute is willing and humble <laughs> enough to be able to like take the back seat and let the students run. But then I'll also say uh, there's also the, the paradox of at least those of us who've been in the game for a while to say, hey, if you do it like this, you might get there faster or you, you might be clearer or this might cause this crowd to erupt. Um, so I think it's the sort of like old schools meeting new school and now what have we got? But some of, some of the programs like at ACT um, had, a, had a piece of the training called civic artistry. And this, this is how I feel about season planning as well. Whenever something goes down, you look f like George Floyd, you look for a play from the past that can speak to the present. Because speaking to the present in the present with a playwright who actually has something to pen in the present, get it down, scrawl it in the present is too dangerous. So all we have to do is take something from the 1960s or 1950s that alludes to what's happening now. And everybody feels good because we're talking about the current moment. So I think academia is in this like mid place, like that CGI place. Wait, it looks like a real uh, hedgehog, but it's not real. It's computer animated. It's like we have to decide: are are we gonna are we gonna really do the thing? 
are we going to make it seem like we're doing the we're thing? Doing the thing. No, and like, so I told my students at the beginning of this semester, you're co-conspirators. And that has been so, tr like watching what they're doing with Zoom. And I've been talking to people who are like, oh, I hate Zoom, right? But like my students, one, they're showing up like with COVID or in the hospital. Like you want to talk yeah. about committed artists, like the struggles, because I'm not at a conservatory. I'm at a school where a lot of kids have a high bar to even show up. And then the things that they are doing, and they understand the technology better than we do. Like the younger they are, the more savvy they are. And, and so I, there are things I bring to them, but there are also things they're bringing into the room. And I think the more we can make that model work, and that again comes from being black, from knowing mm -hmm. that the structure was not perfect, right? So I know that they have answers that I don't have. They're bringing game theory into theater making and doing some really cool, stuff that like then artistic directors or administrators are looking at but these kids have it and so it's like why wouldn't i collaborate that would make me a bad teacher like if i'm not <laughs> taking if i'm not taking what you bring into the room and then offering you what i have in whatever way you can i am not a good teacher yeah it makes you out of touch and like, what are people in touch with? I'm, I'm thinking about Black Panther. I'm thinking about those relics in the museum. Um, why do we keep celebrating the museum? Yeah. And I, I think that's where the shifting of the training for the new American theater is going to shift because we're not training the museum. Because, the, because there's so much energy and so much momentum in the present moment all around you. But it's really real. I mean, I know a lot of teachers who are in New York and other places who literally have people, the students have people in their families dying of COVID in the next room. I mean, I'm not dealing with that that I know of as a teacher in San Diego. But for some people, what people are doing just to be present and create and want a place to leave everything that's closing in on them. And I think theater is still that place, even though it kind of feels like a hobby. Like we're all Dungeons and Dragons freaks and everybody's just like doing <laughs> the same things we've always done. Uh, but there's a reason why people believe it's important in like K through 12. And then why do people not care once you hit 18? I'm still thinking about that. Where, you know, we always kind of get towards the end of these conversations as, as we've been talking about <clears throat> moving forward. And I always like to phrase it in a way it's like, you know, as we've been talking about, it's usually on the organizations. What do the organizations do going forward? What's the organization's responsibilities moving forward? How do they, how do they make sure that this happens? How do they make sure equity? How do they make sure representation? But I like to I like the two prong it. I don't like to just leave it on the organizations because it's almost like I feel about the government. They ain't coming to help you. <laughs> <laughs> they say they are, but they ain't coming to help you. So I kind of like to I, I kind of like to get the the two prong approach of what is your what is your advice to organizations, especially the we, statements have been made. The nice little Instagram posts and Facebook posts and all that good stuff has been made and put out there and the, the committees are formed and then this and that and this, that, this, that, and you come into the room now and you come talk to us and you come over here and you, uh. okay, that's all great. <laughs> where, where, where do we realistically go from here? Because like you said, the five minutes and not, not just the five minutes on the executive order, five minutes on the attention span, the five minutes when everybody's ready to go back to brunch in a couple of months. You know what I mean? Like when the urgency is over with and everybody's comfortable again, like where do or what what should be the main things that organizations are looking to do going forward? But more importantly, what are the things that the artists, the workers, those who are on this end looking at these inequities and looking at these issues, what should they be focused on moving forward, in your opinion? I would say the first thing, and I, I ask people to do this when I do that training that you don't understand, Ahmed. <laughs> I'm um, trying to get it. I'm getting it. I'm trying to pick it up. It's all good. Um, but 
one thing I started asking is when you make a list of all the good you've done, all the great things you've done, why you're an important person in this, make a list of the damage you've done, intentional or not. Where mm -hmm. have you been complicit? Who has left your city? Who doesn't do this anymore mm -hmm. because of the way that you have done this? Because I think people are really quick to point to the, like the five black faces on their season brochure, or here's the play that we did two years ago, or here's why I've always been a bastion of diversity. And so there's a couple of things like who's not in your rooms? Why has your leadership looked like this for this long? Who have you left out in the cold? And you can look at the Black Theater in San Diego if we want to talk about equitable funding and where resources have gone and who is who is getting promoted, right? And, and it's not, I mean, I've had really great conversations with Delisi about this. It's not making one person prominent, right? It's how are you sustaining a community of artists? Um, and so I think the first thing before organizations run off and do more is to is to make a list of the damage they've done and really sit with that in a way that is uncomfortable. Um, solidarity, and I've said this before, doesn't come without sacrifice. So what power are you willing to give up? What money are you willing to give up? How much of a risk are you willing to take? to do that. That's my organizational thing, because otherwise I don't want to hear how you're standing beside us. But then the minute something comes down from the federal government, you you can't because it's too risky. Um, mm -hmm. For for Black artists and other artists in various groups and of color, I say find community, find your people. Those people have sustained me. Jacole was, I, I remember the week she got to San Diego, right? <laughs> Come on, girl. And we, I mean, and then Delicia reached out and she was like, how dare you guys go to a movie? Let's like, we're going to have a colored girls night. And those, mm. I have those communities in every community I've lived in, in New York. And it really and was that people were like, what? You guys are hanging out and it's black yeah. girls. How come I wasn't invited? Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. And that group still meets. Like when the pandemic happened, that group helped sustain me. In mm. Charlotte, I have that group of, so find your people and work with your people and do not, compete with them don't let there be a scarcity model work with them right and and the black organizations are doing that now that black seed project that's coming out yes. the less the less that we let them say oh well we only have room for two and the more we work together and we don't let it be this person gets it or this person gets it there's nothing because if nobody shows up if we all say no unless this happens that looks bad. That is where our power is, right? And to the white artists, I would say, where have you had privilege? Where have you had things? And Jason Hiles said this. He said, what I thought was talent was actually my privilege. And not that he's not incredibly talented, but I so appreciated that he said that out loud to my students, because I remember seeing that as a young black artist and being like, maybe there's something wrong with me that there's only one part for me a year, right? And so where has that been privileged and where have you been allowed to excel and what now probably feels like a little bit of a retraction and how do you support going forward? How, how can you support those voices going forward? So there's, I mean, there's something for everybody and it cannot just be on the black artists. And, and the thing that happened in San Diego that I want to stop is white people are really comfortable in marginalizations that aren't race. So instead of talking about race, there's always a conversation about another type of marginalization. And the conversation that needs to happen right now is about race and particularly about anti-Blackness. Hmm. And we need to stop. And, and Black people exist in all of those other marginalizations. They exist in female, you know, in femininity and in you know, like the intersectionality in disability in queerness, like we exist in all of those spaces, but we have to address anti-Blackness specifically mm. oh yep anti-blackness um i would encourage people to say the word black if you're talking about black people and if you use the word <laughs> bipoc we will not assume that you're talking about black people mm. Mm. so i i would ask Ooh, yeah, everybody yeah. to everybody black to divest from the term bipoc um as a representation of what you will go through as a black artist so divest from bipoc okay that's that's that um 
I I think uh, you know a few things are swirling in my head. One is we need to. I'm thinking of I can't remember who the producer is who like discovered the Beatles, and that producer also discovered a few other like major folks in the music industry. You know, there's there's a there's an agreement that theater makes where we're going to find the one. We're going to find the Lynn Nottage or the this one or the that one and then we're all going to produce the work of this and we're going to pass the idol around. Everybody gets a piece and then we're going to put that idol to the side and find the next one. I would encourage folks to start making a place for the unknowns and start taking some risk in some major unknowns. And if you don't know who they are, find the people who can put the unknowns in front of you. And those might be administrators, they might be artistic leaders, they might be actors, designers, um, because I think there's so much untapped um, potential in people that aren't even, not even at the table, they're not even on the block. And I think to invest in that would be major. Now I'm going to take from the folks at like Twitter and uh, Netscape and, you know, Mozilla. These folks understand that best ideas are not coming out of meetings. Mm -hmm. I would say you need to make room. And if the room needs to be all black, if the room needs to be mix of people or whoever it is, you need to make space to create the bar. You gotta create the foosball table, the ping pong table that lets people just hang out, kiki it up, talk and go, oh, Ahmad, wait, what'd you just say? And now because you said that, it's riffing this whole other idea that would not happen if everybody is on time at the Zoom meeting and now who has what to say? That goes back to like seasonal thinking versus chronological thinking. So how can you make spaces for seasonal thinking? Um, I had one other thought. Oh, 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 okay. So for the artists in training endeavors and other endeavors, here's what we know. We know that uh, what you want to eat is not going to be on the menu. Mm. Um, so because we know that going into that, going into this, and it may or may not change in the next 50 years or 100, um, you have got to, from day one, get into the kitchen yourself and start cooking and we know we know we're everybody here who's in this room who's listening who's gonna listen later we are doing five six seven eight times more to be where we are and we are also probably biting our tongues more than everybody anybody else has to bite their tongue um so because what you need to move forward in your artistry is not going to be presented to you by no fault of anybody's other than the structure and the system and how people have done it, that you have to not depend on anybody to give you what you need. So you've got to seek the people out who can get you what you need. Because you shouldn't, You, my belief is, you shouldn't leave any of these places angry. If it's not there in the meeting, ask this person, set up a, another meeting. If it wasn't there in class, bring that person. We're having our own class. Mm -hmm. You got to do that. The show is not in the season. We're doing a counter show. And it's just, it's going to be practice and producing and just making your own way because it's, it's not, it doesn't, it's not there for you. It will be there in fits and starts, but it's not designed to do that. Can you, can you guys just bear with me for a couple more minutes? Because um, there's something you said, Stephen, that I think needs to be unpacked. And it's, some, it's something that came up in a conversation I had with Thomas Jones when he was on here. And Tom, it was it was your BIPOC comment. And me and me and Tom Jones, we were both talking. And Tom said, like, yeah, like BIPOC. I don't know what that is. That's not me. I don't, I don't. And, and, and I agree with him. I was like, yeah, I don't, I, that's, I don't know what that is. Like, I, and it's. It's funny because I, I saw I see a meme every once in a while where there's a white woman talking to a black woman and she's like, how do you feel about being by box? You know, call me black. It's like, but you're, you don't identify. And the woman goes, no, blackity, blackity, black, black, black. <laughs> can you can you break that down a little bit 
for people who heard that so that they can understand why they might be saying BIPOC to people who identify as black and that black people might go like, uh, okay, what, what does that have to do with me? Or that doesn't specifically, can you unpack that a little bit, please? Okay, you, you. <laughs> She's dying. Let her go, Stephen. Let I'm her go. Her go. Let her go. You like double Dutch. I'm like, oh, okay. Let her jump um, in. Let her jump in. No, so here's the thing: people of color, BIPOC is useful in very limited circumstances because we don't like to say non-white, and we don't like to acknowledge that everything there's a false universality around whiteness, right? So. When we talk about politics and suburban moms, we're not talking about me, even though I live in the suburbs and I drive a minivan. We are not talking about me. We are talking literally, about- Literally lives in the suburbs and drives a minivan. Not anymore. Not anymore. I freed myself. But we're, um, they're not talking about me. They're talking about whiteness, right? And the NPR finally did a report on this because we're like freaking out about the fact that there is a contingent of Latinx people who voted for Trump. And every Latinx person is going, duh, we're not all the same. And this is the problem in training. And Stephen has alluded to this, like we're West Indian, we're Nigerian, we're from Philly, North Carolina Black is very different than Boston Black, right? And so to not even take those, but to take every person of color who is not white and conflate them into one group. When I went to China talking about decolonization, literally the theater department said to me, why would we be interested in that? We are colonizers. So in that context, yeah. this idea of BIPOC does not. And so in theater, I think it can be more useful than in other spaces because I think the one thing that all the racism in theater does is a lot of us who aren't white have very similar experiences but there are different constituencies with multifaceted histories and even the groups that BIPOC represents. When we talk about an Asian contingency, that is so vast and broad, right? And in no other space except whiteness are all these groups lumped together, right? Like you don't go to Japan and have a conflation with Filipinos or South Asians, right? So the fact that it is used, it's just another way of saying not white now where it is valuable is it does highlight like blackness and indigenous but it was not introduced to me by a black person it was introduced by another person uh, of color right. who decided it was a valuable tool in a moment of anti-blackness when we needed yeah. to be talking about blackness and we started talking about a larger group that clearly does not always line up with black interests so that is where there are times I use it when I am talking about systems of whiteness and their effect on other people in a very specific way but also it's not that hard to say black latinx middle eastern indigenous right like mm -hmm. and to start well, saying, no and that we didn't just to that point sorry to jump in on that yeah. but just to that point that we can't even say the words black indigenous and people of color we got to go by that <laughs> we, we put it this tiny but we still we can't even say all that it's but here's where it becomes problematic where it starts the same thing when we had like affirmative action that also included all women right so we know that affirmative action benefits white women more than anybody else and when we start conflating these when the actual problem is anti-blackness or when the actual problem is um anti indigenousness or anti you know native americans or anti asian sentiment right then we start to the the amelioration to the problem the way we fix the problem gets conflated in ways that aren't actually solving things and it still keeps us in the white gaze because then people say no we have a person of color in our season mm -hmm. we don't need a black show because we're doing two latinx shows and a jewish show so Black people, come see that, right? And I want to see that. I celebrate the communities I live in, but we have to get specific and we have to say the things. BIPOC is so often a way for people to avoid, like Stephen said. And I remember Stephen saying this in an interview. I didn't say they were against people of color. I said they were anti-Black, <laughs> right? <laughs> because right. Stephen was replaced <laughs> with a person of, you know, like, and there are people of color that people feel more comfortable with in a lot mm -hmm. of ways and people don't want to talk about that and that does not mean I will not stand beside my Chicana my Latinx my 
Asian brothers and sisters, I will march. I, and we as a community, we march, we fight with them. But we also have a right, and this is particularly a problem in the Black American community, we have a right to our own identity and heritage and to our stories and to tell our stories and to not have our stories erased and to recognize in all of the groups where we come up against conflict and to be fully present as ourselves. And BIPOC does not allow us to do that. Mm. Kaya just jumped in on the double dutch and then threw the ropes at it. <laughs> Kaya's a scholar. <laughs> Kaya's an artist trying to make sure grant funding gets distributed. <laughs> which it doesn't in these That's what it comes down to. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that. Because I, I did want to take a moment to unpack that for people who are listening and people who have been hearing that term and have been kind of wondering like, what, well, how come, why? Well, mm. or, or maybe looking at me like, how come our man doesn't respond when we use that term? Why does his eyebrow go up? Like, why does he... <laughs> <laughs> but, Steven, but thank do you, you have anything me. you would want to add to that? Um, I, I just feel like, you know, it's, it's that. It's the Beverly Hills Black. It's the Boston Black. It's the Florida Black. It's the Cuban, Peruvian, Guatemalan, Honduran. It's uh, the less we erase people's specificity and the more we not only celebrate, but like draw it out and seek to draw it out, the more everything is going to expand. And then like at um, ACT, then when you're starting to do that, you can do, guess what? An Irish play. Guess what? A Polish play. Because yeah, you all are white, but guess what? You were once Norwegian, and you were once Danish, and you were German. Now you're white. Welcome to America. So and I think I think it get... serves everybody to get more specific. Go ahead, Kyle. No, but also like again, false universality, the myth of universality, which is a there's a Korean American scholar who came up with that. But like, you get to be quirky. Or I was watching Enola Holmes with my son, and oh. I was like, what a lovely story about a creative young girl who is quirky and why are all the black youth I see fighting the cop? Like, why can't we have this story about a young black girl, right? So you get to be the geek, the jock, the scholar, the da 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 da. So do we, right? And that's because that specificity exists when we're talking about this, that specificity exists in whiteness because whiteness is the assumed norm. You get to be specific about all the other ways in which you exist. We are just asking to even be recognized in the group in which we exist. And then yes, in that group, I'm the awkward black girl, right? Like that is my, I am not, the, right? Like that's part of my thing and I love it and I live in it. And so I want to see more plays about that. More Lydia Diamond, please. Right? Like, <laughs> no, Kaya, I feel you on that. I always say I'm only cool in white spaces. Like ah. I'm a freaking geeky little nerd in black yeah. spaces. Oh, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm a theater geek and like what? Who? What? But no, in white spaces, I'm cool as hell. <laughs> that's how it goes down. That's that's how it happens, right? Well, you know what? Let's let's wrap this thing up. We've been talking for a while. We I know we we could all sit here and talk for another couple of hours. <laughs> um, Let me get the wine. Hi, <laughs> Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us on We Are Listening. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much for bringing. We you know we're, like I said we're we're trying to we're trying to. We're trying to catch everybody from every aspect of this thing. So number one, people know how diverse we are as black people, but then also they know how diverse our skill sets are in this industry and how much we do in every aspect of this industry. So I really appreciate appreciate you guys coming on. And I know y'all gonna be returning guests. I know y'all gonna come back because we got some more stuff to talk about. <laughs> Oh no, Kaya's already pitching me shows. We were on the phone the other day. And she said, okay, so I know I'm coming on with Steven, but I've got this one and I really want to do that with her as well. And can we, yes, yes, we say it like that? I just said it. <laughs> so yes, you will both be back. Thank you so much. Uh, Jacole, you got anything for the folks? Anything else to tell the folks? Thanks for listening. 
Want to remind you guys, make sure you come back two weeks from now where we'll be going back to back days with We Are Listening. Uh, no, November, as Sharissa corrected me earlier, I'm already a month ahead. I'm yeah. December, <laughs> November, Wednesday, November 18th, 530 here on We Are Listening. San Diego Rep Artistic Director Sam Woodhouse will be our guest and he will be talking about his vision and the Rep's vision concerning equity and diversity as we move forward. And then make sure you come back and join us the next day, November 19th. We will have Jasmine Sadler, a new board member here at San Diego Rep. And let me tell you something about Jasmine. She's a real life rocket scientist. That is not hyperbole. She is a <laughs> rocket scientist and a trained ballerina. And she is now on what? the San Diego Rep board. Yeah, Jasmine's no joke. And we will also have John Brooks, who was a candidate for the 53rd district seat earlier this year. He is a board member at Moxie and he is also a filmmaker, has a film coming up. We'll be talking to him about that. And we also have Stephanie Bolger will be coming on on that episode, board member at the Old Globe. So that's going to be our board member episode. So we'll be talking about things with the board and, uh, <laughs> you know, come back and join us. Again, Kaya, Steve, and Jacob, thank you all very much. All of you listening, thank you very much sdrep.org slash listening and don't forget to visit lahoyaplayhouse.org oldglobe.org see what they got going on there and uh yeah you see them they up here they all over here um and that's a wrap thank you all very much and we'll talk to you all soon good night y'all good night